All right, hello, my name is James DeBizer. I'm a senior manager and senior scientist at the Stratospheric Observatory for Infrared Astronomy. And I'm here to talk to you about a few of the more interesting recent results from SOFIA. There we go. So what is SOFIA? It's an observatory built out of a heavily modified Boeing 747 aircraft. And mounted inside this aircraft is a 2.5 meter diameter telescope that's optimized for performing science in the far infrared. So you might ask why build an observatory out of an aircraft? Well, we see here that there's a large swath of wavelength space from about 25 to 350 microns, where light does not make it to ground-based observatories. Now, I'll refer to this wavelength range roughly as the far infrared. SOFIA flies in the stratosphere, and that's high enough to get above 99.9% .9 of the atmosphere's infrared-absorbing water vapor. And that allows it to observe a very broad wavelength range that entirely encompasses the far infrared. Of course, infrared satellite observatories like JWST, Spitzer, Herschel, these are ways of getting around these atmospheric issues. However, unlike SOFIA, these facilities cannot be fixed once they're launched into space. Uh, they can't be upgraded either. So the ability for SOFIA to constantly update and upgrade its instrumentation can keep it at the cutting edge of science. So if you can do a wide variety of science, and in this brief talk, I will discuss three of the more recent and exciting scientific results to demonstrate the fantastic science that Sophia does, and in so doing, I'll touch on some of Sophia's capabilities. I'll first begin by talking about the Sophia Galactic Center Legacy Survey and tell you about some of the first results, as well as opportunities available to you to use those data yourself. This is an image of our inner galaxy, and it's the highest resolution infrared map yet achieved at wavelengths beyond 20 microns. This Spitzer space satellite image shows a tremendous amount of detail, but it is oversaturated and shows a fair amount of saturation in the brightest and most interesting areas, seen here in white. Now, Sophia has no saturation issues, and as part of a legacy project, we revisited these areas concentrating on those that were saturated in the Spitzer 24 and 70 micron. And here we see the SOFIA data, which now reveals the beautiful and complex structures that were previously hidden in these areas at these wavelengths. Several regions, seen here in red, have already been the subject of study by the legacy group and their pilot studies. However, there's a lot more to explore here. And since these SOFIA data were taken as part of a legacy project, the data are available right now for anyone to download and analyze. So if you're interested, please go to the URSA archive at IPAC. Um, also this morning, there was a special SOFIA webinar, and it was organized to present this publicly available data set to all interested researchers and to discuss potential projects, address different techniques for deriving information from the data and exploiting its scientific value. So if you're interested, this webinar will be available for download by this time tomorrow. And related to this, if you're interested in these collect center data, or any data in the SOFIA archive, but you need funding, there are funding opportunities available to you right now. There's presently an open call for archival proposals, that link here, but additionally, there's an informational SOFIA webinar tomorrow about this topic entitled SOFIA Archive Opportunities, Science Ready Data and Funding. So let's get back to the Galactic Center data. Combining these SOFIA data that you see here with Herschel 70 micron data, and overlaying an unsaturated near-infrared star field from Spitzer reveals this beautiful composite look at our inner galaxy. And I think this single image provides a simple but profound visual demonstration of the powerful synergies that are possible when SOFIA data is combined with data from other wavelengths, like those from facilities, those facilities like Spitzer and Herschel. So now let's zoom into the environment close to our gal galaxy's central supermassive black hole. Within the inner two parsecs, we see what is known as the circumpolar ring. These SOFIA data are the highest resolution observations of the far from emission from this ring ever taken. The ring structure is centered on and revolving around our galaxy's supermassive black hole, Sag J star. And we can see the bright infrared structures that are referred to as the mini spiral bonds. And these appear to be structures that are funneling material towards the supermassive black hole. But proof that this is actually happening beyond just morphological considerations. 
And that's where, where data from an additional SOFIA instrument, a polarimeter named Hawk Plus, can help. Far infrared polarimeters like Hawk Plus have the ability to map out magnetic fields traced by dust grains uh, that align with those magnetic fields and emit and polarized light from the far infrared. And this allows us to visualize the magnetic fields in the galactic center like this. And now we see that the magnetic field lines do indeed lie along and trace the minimum spiral arms. And because it's easier for material to move along magnetic field lines rather than perpendicular to them, these data reinforce the idea that these arms are streams of material in highly eccentric orbits whose convergence point is not exactly the location of side of It's believed that material falling in towards the galactic center is being channeled by these magnetic fields into orbit around the supermassive light. Now, our galaxy center is rather quiescent for a galaxy the size of the Milky Way. And so it could perhaps be that the magnetic fields here are regulating the amount of material that falls onto our supermassive black hole. Next, I'll discuss uh, Sophia observations concerning the role of feedback from massive stars. Now, we're all likely familiar with the beautiful optical images of the Orion Nebula, like this one here. But in the mid-infrared and far-infrared, of course, we get a direct view of the structures that make up the nebula via their dust emission, like in the Spitzer 8 micron image. However, the dust here is intermixed with gas, and we can see great spatial correlations between the dust emission and ionized carbon gas emission, or C2 emission, that's seen by Sophia's great instrument at 158 microns. And while the optical image, the Spitzer dust image, and these great gas images reveal similar looking structures, the, biz the biggest advantage of the SOFIA data taken by Great is that it is taken in a way that also captures information about the velocity of the gas observed. And so here's an animation of the carbon-2 gas emission in Orion made by stepping through images that are generated increasing gas velocities along the line of sight to Orion. And as this movie plays, one thing becomes clear when we look down to the south region in a region known as the Bell Bubble. The bubble is expanding. Now, interior to this bubble, and not seen in this data, lies a massive O star that can be seen in visible light named Theta 1c. And its strong stellar winds have swept up material into the shell that we see in the Bell bubble. So, this is all very neat and cool looking, but why are these data important? Well, they're important because they provide insight into the role of stellar feedback. 